this morning, uh, we are at what are called the workshop final briefings. And what, what are we trying to do here? This is this semester and next semester, uh, we do a management simulation where we take a environmental bill that's been proposed but not enacted. And over the course of the summer, we try to understand the science behind the issue and learn how to explain that science to non-scientific decision makers. So today's briefings will really be about understanding the science of these problems and these solutions explained to people like me uh, who are political scientists uh, who really are not trained as environmental science. Uh, I've had to learn a lot of environmental science in my career uh, and I wish that I had a summer of science courses the way you've had. And so it, it probably would have saved me a, a lot of misery trying to learn this on my own. Uh, try reading an environmental chemistry textbook without an environmental chemistry professor uh, and you'll understand what I'm talking about. Uh, so you have the advantage of a science curriculum that's designed for you and this workshop is how we hope to teach you to work together and communicate. Next semester we take the same statutes and we say what would happen if this bill actually passed and we develop a plan for implementing it. This is a long way from an idea to an implemented reality and that's what we'll be doing next semester. So let's begin our, our process uh, with uh, the first group, uh, Professor Rosen's group, will come forward and give our first briefing. Good morning. <clears throat> Big Spring Creek in Pennsylvania was once a pristine river with thriving trout populations and a renowned sport fishing industry throughout the mid-1900s, whose ecosystem was decimated after consecutive aquaculture facilities were set up along its shores. These facilities, which served as hatcheries for trout, released an untold amount of pollution into the river below, causing eutrophication and effectively killing off the aquatic life within that system. Despite following regulations of the time, these facilities uh, effectively uh, created a dead zone in an area which depended on the life of the river for its uh, tourism and recreation economies. My name is Daniel Wall, and this morning I will be briefing you on Bill H.R. 962, which seeks to preserve fishing on wild and scenic rivers through the regulation of the aquaculture industry. Big Spring Creek is a case study in mismanagement and poor regulation that H.R. 962 seeks to address. The issue at hand being, how do we enable sustainable aquaculture production and preserve our wild and scenic rivers at the same time? We often view preservation and sustainability as two sides of the same coin, but what happens when these ideals become incompatible? Throughout the remainder of this briefing, we will explore this crux and answer the following questions. Firstly, what are wild and scenic rivers? How can they be affected by aquaculture, and where does H.R. 962 come into play? Lastly, who are the stakeholders, and why are they concerned? So firstly, I would like to define what this bill means by wild and scenic rivers. According to the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act of 1968, they are portions of rivers which are preserved in free-flowing condition, which are protected for the benefit and enjoyment of present and future generations. They are essentially the corners of our river systems, which have yet to be impacted by industry and human development. In total, they encompass 12,000 742 miles of 208 rivers in 42 states and are managed by the Department of the Interior and the National Park Service. These rivers equate to less than a quarter of 1% of all of our river systems, yet they provide a number of ecosystem services. Most importantly, in the context of H.R. 962, is their provision of recreation and tourism. So next we might wonder how at risk are these rivers actually? On this map, we can see a picture of aquaculture nationally. With the darker the state, the more aquaculture facilities they have per capita, mostly in the form of marine and riparian fisheries. Outlined in blue, we have our wild and scenic rivers, overlaid with 15 facilities which our team's research has identified as being on these rivers. These, faci these facilities individually produce between 20,000 and 200,000 pounds of trout annually. <clears throat> 
providing the U.S. population 3.9 million servings of trout per year. And this makes up about 5% of the total trout production uh, from aquaculture nationally. The primary form of aquaculture that we see on these rivers are what's known as raceway facilities. They are constructed adjacent to rivers, diverting water upstream into the system, into man-made tank ponds and tanks, and then subsequently release the water downstream. A farmer using one of these facilities can produce, on average, about 20,000 pounds of trout annually. And this was, in fact, the same type of facility that we saw in Big Spring Creek where the fundamental flaw was an inability to mitigate the pollutant outflow, only using a screen at the point of discharge to capture any of the effluent. Aquaculture, like all forms of modern agriculture, require outside inputs in order to remain viable, and as a cause and effect, produce outputs in the form of pollution. Hydrologic functions are too complex to control where they affect our natural environments. Once chemicals enter the water cycle, it is hard to delineate where they will go and what they will affect. Synthetic chemicals like antibiotics and pesticides can pose a possible threat to human populations due to their ability to bioaccumulate throughout the food chain. Antibiotics like oxytetracycline can cause antibiotic resistance, leading to greater susceptibility to disease to individuals within an ecosystem. Pesticides like glyphosate act as endocrine disruptors and can cause cancer in humans, such as non-Hodgkin lymphoma. However, in considering the risk to wild and scenic rivers, the most immediate threat comes from nitrogen and phosphorus runoff in the form of, of fish food and uh, fish waste. And these basically combine to ultimately create aquatic dead zones within the river system. In short, eutrophication is the most immediate threat to wild and scenic rivers, as was the case in Big Spring Creek. There do exist naturally occurring levels of nitrogen and phosphorus in all rivers, and they vary from river to river. As seen in the table, the EPA has established water quality criteria for acceptable levels of nitrogen and phosphorus to exist in rivers. However, once these levels are surpassed, eutrophication becomes an immediate threat as even small changes in a river's chemical composition can have drastic effects down the line. Of the 15 facilities that our, our team's research has identified, they produce about 340,000 pounds of excrement waste per year per 370,000 fish. As a comparison, assuming that there's about 70 of us in this room, in one year we will combine to produce 28,000 pounds of excrement. And with that in mind, there's plenty of free coffee in back, so please help yourself. It should also be noted that these facilities do not have to be directly on the wild and scenic portion of a river in order to affect the entire river body. And it is with this in mind that HR 962 exists. It proposes that any existing aquaculture facility reach a level of zero pollution or be shut down with existing facilities being given a three-year window to come into compliance with the law. New facilities will have to come into compliance before they even are permitted to operate. For many, this seems extreme, as the EPA has established, under the Clean Water Act, acceptable levels of pollutant discharge, and this bill seems to be merely targeting a few specific aquaculture facilities. And in effect, this bill has created two camps of stakeholders. As I mentioned in the beginning of this presentation, the issue at hand is the ideals of sustainability versus the ideals of preservation. Those that support this bill are in favor of preservation of wild and scenic rivers at all costs and include environmental groups, recreational fishermen, and the tourism industries associated with these rivers. On the opposite side of the aisle are those in favor of sustainable fisheries and include aquaculture farmers, national and state farm bureaus, and the National Aquaculture Association. Their concern with this bill is that it is ultimately a ban on aquaculture, as reaching this level of zero pollution is essentially impossible. And it also interferes with growth in the aquaculture industry nationally. On this graph, we can see that the United States trout production is actually in decline and is projected to be surpassed by trout imports by the year 2030, though I should note this is not indicative of the entire aquaculture industry. 
Those against H.R. 962 would argue that the need for legislation to support aqua, we need legislation to support aquaculture now more than ever, not placing new limits on its growth as an industry. Those in favor of H.R. 962 see this argument differently. For them, it is not about limiting the aquaculture industry, but protecting the inherent value of wild and scenic rivers and the value they hold to local economies. For an example, uh, the home of H.R. 962, the Aw Sable River in Michigan, reports an annual revenue from recreation around $3 million. And as you can see from the rest of these examples of tourism on wild and scenic rivers, if they were to become the next Big Spring Creek, it could potentially devastate their local economies. Now, aquaculture industry could mitigate the risks they pose to wild and scenic rivers through a couple of key improvements. Again, using raceway aquaculture and trout production as an example, Things like physical filtration in the form of um, settlement tanks, which remove solid waste, and also biological filtration in the form of artificial wetlands, which take up nitrogen and phosphorus, could be implemented. While these could be costly improvements for aquaculture businesses, our team's research has shown that it will only add about a 10% increase to the overall operation of the facility, and they can be scaled to meet the size of production. However, as seen from these numbers on this slide, none of these will actually get a facility down to that level of zero pollution, which the bill um, asks for. Ultimately, the success of an aquaculture facility to come into compliance with H.R. 962 is up to the governing body in place, which for the purposes of this bill is the Department of Interior. They will mandate reporting, make sure all facilities come into compliance, and issue permits for operation and making sure that all come into compliance with H.R. 962. This bill establishes a dichotomy of preservation versus sustainability, where it seeks an output of zero pollution and a preservation of the wild and scenic rivers. But the Department of the Interior, through their actions, will, deci will decide what the outcome of this bill is and what that looks like, with the ultimate outcome being the ecological health of wild and scenic rivers. In conclusion, the issues present in the growing aquaculture industry aren't going anywhere. Aquaculture is a modern necessity, meeting the needs of depleting wild fish stocks and the need to supply sustainable protein to growing populations. The U.S. is involved in less than 1% of the total global aquaculture produ production, despite having 8% of the world's population. But according to the UN, North America as a whole is posed to have about a 5% increase in aquaculture production by the year 2030. In order to meet these production goals, we need sensible legislation which pragmatically addresses this growing need. However, this should not be at the expense of our natural resources, in this case, our national rivers which need to be pr protected and promoted, remaining viable for present and future generations. So in conclusion, I would like to thank my output team, Amanda, Ethan, and Becky, for their great work on this final presentation. Um, my workshop group, the School of Fish, for their great work throughout the semester. Uh, special thanks to Diana Lee, our fearless leader, and our advisor, Louise Rosen, for her guidance throughout this entire process. And lastly, to my cohort, uh, invited guests, and our ESP faculty, thank you for your attention during this briefing. Great presentation. I, I wondered whether you had come across any examples of people trying to uh, uh, produce joint operations between the uh, aquaculture and hydroponics or not in your research? Um, that wasn't too specific to our bill. We were kind of focusing on facilities that were on wild and scenic rivers, and these were pr primarily uh, producing trout, so there wasn't a lot of crossover in industries that we found. Uh, any other questions? Any professor questions uh, yeah, take it over easy. here? Okay. I, I can 
yield to a student if there is one. Okay. <laughs> Uh, great presentation, Thank you. Uh, and I particularly appreciate all the original research that went into getting these numbers together. Uh, I was curious, uh, it seems to me a, a fairly obvious solution would be to support aquaculture on the non-wild and scenic rivers, and I wondered whether or not you uh, looked at whether it would be possible to meet some of these, these projected goals for 5% growth in that by I increasing facilities in rivers that aren't so uh, valuable and already protected. Yeah, that would obviously be a better way to go about aquaculture production. Um, we just kind of use that as kind of like a background to saying that aquaculture needs to increase, and it already is increasing. And the main forms of aquaculture that we found were actually marine fisheries, uh, which don't seem to have a problem um, with their growth. Um, you know, again, we're looking specifically at Th this bill was brought up to protect a specific wild and scenic river uh, in particular, and then, uh, and then obviously can be applied broadly to all wild and scenic rivers. So it was more about preserving the rivers more than shutting down the aquaculture industry. So, um, but yes, they, they could obviously happen on other rivers other than the wild and scenic ones. Hey, um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about, um, you referenced your team's research um, in terms of the cost of the aquaculture facilities and so on. Uh, if you could mention a bit more details about the kind of research you guys conducted. Yeah, so a big issue with this bill is that there's not necessarily a national register of aquaculture businesses. Uh, we had to go state by state, um, often contacting state representatives, uh, doing our own kind of research, looking up where an aquaculture facility might be, and then referencing it back to a map we have of aquaculture of uh, wild and scenic rivers. So there's a lot of back and forth. Uh, our research found about 15 facilities. There could be more. These were all the ones we were able to locate. Uh, an issue with that is often these aquaculture facilities will use a PO box address. Um, so it's hard to see if they are actually on a wild and scenic portion of the river or just merely connected to it. 